we can start again. So ideas, I guess that you can start uh, recording again if you want. I've done so, yes. Okay. So we were on slide, I guess, uh, uh, 60, 64, no, sorry, uh, six, uh, 68. So we said, okay, now it's time to criticize our model because our model, as we understood, is not so much effective in uh, reproducing, in uh, let's say, uh, reproducing the pattern of uh, of my data. So uh, how should we do? Let me put full screen. So maybe changing the uh, likelihood, the negative binomial. Negative binomial distribution is always a capturing phenomenon of over dispersions. So maybe it is uh, uh, much well uh, suited. So negative binomial, it is. Uh, basically similar to similarly similar to the, the Poisson distribution but now we are assuming that there is uh, also a further parameter parameter accounting for uh, the over dispersion so uh, if we use the, uh, the the negative binomial distribution and now i'm not going to launch directly the code my i just want to show you directly with the slides basically if we put the ppc dense overlay function now if you if you see the fit of the model, I mean the replications under the model uh, seem quite perfect, seem very very good, promising, uh, closer to the, the data end than what was happening with the Poisson distribution. If we do the same with the proportions of zero, uh, the statistics that I created before to check uh, which is the proportion of zero in the replicated data set and which is the proportion of zero in the observed. A data vector, as you can see here, uh, basically the proportion of zero is quite uh, uh, is falling within the histogram of the replicated uh, proportion of zero replications. If we look at the residuals, so still the standard die residuals maybe are better than before, but still there is something which is not captured by the model. So maybe the negative binomial now it's uh, of course doing better and better and so maybe we should uh, of course switching to the negative binomial likelihood uh, however we still have some very large standard residuals and maybe uh, this might be because we are ignoring uh, the nature of the data as a data scientist as a statistician we should always take into consideration which is the uh, origin of the data which is the nature of the data and my, our data are clustered by buildings so basically I'm collecting for each building uh, the different complaints in each month. Of course, maybe we should uh, acknowledge for a sort of hierarchical, stru hierarchical structure uh, between, uh, between the buildings. So uh, let's add the uh, hierarchical intercept, alpha, beta, alpha B, sorry, for the individual level. Uh, we are going to assume that the number of complaints, the height complaints in the bit building is a negative binomial, but this time the linear predictor of my negative binomial distribution is, uh, I'm putting here as covariates the traps, uh, I'm putting as covariate the offsets, uh, so the offset is of course added as a deterministic predictor, deterministic covariate, uh, with the parameter fixed to one. I'm putting here the dichotomous uh, covariate, the super, uh, the living super, which is equal whether the uh, building has the people responsible for the uh, for the building, uh, zero if not. And I'm adding something which is taking care of the variability between the buildings. So basically I'm going towards a hierarchical model. So I'm not considering uh, any more data as coming from the same population, but I'm considering the data as coming uh, from 10 different buildings. And I'm assuming an exchangeable prior distribution for this uh, uh, random intercept across the different buildings. So since uh, one of the uh, predictors vary only by building, uh, we can rewrite also the model quite efficiently in this way. So the linear predictor is defined as alpha bi where of course uh, uh, alpha bi it is the intercept of the building in which the height complaint is registered so basically this is an indexes uh, which varies between 1 and 10 so if the height complaint is registered in the first building then i have b1 uh, if the height complaint is registered in the second building this is a2 and so on b traps plus 
uh, the in this case uh, the the offset term, and we can write uh, in this case uh, uh, alpha beta from a normal distribution mu plus uh, b super uh, sigma uh, sigma square uh, sigma square alpha. So basically, I'm uh, going towards uh, a sort of uh, not sort uh, towards a hierarchical model accounting for the variability between the buildings. Because of course, I realized by starting from the I mean lowest level a very post simple Poisson distribution and only one covariate then adding the offset uh, but using again the Poisson distribution then uh, using changing the likelihood using a negative binomial now I change uh, again the structure of my model which is hierarchical and I'm also adding all uh, the other predictors in my model so let's see. Uh, let's go to see what happens. So let me go directly in the uh, in the stand code. So let me share the screen now uh, in the R console. You should visualize the R console. Let's go to take uh, the um, the past control uh, code two. If you want to directly follow the uh, the analysis, past control code two. So uh, let's go to store uh, the data. So I already compiled and uh, fit the model. So basically the first part is exactly the same as before. Here from line 26 uh, to line, uh, let's say uh, 57, and then also to line uh, 72, uh, there is a data arrangement uh, to allow the data to be defined in terms of the different groups. This is very important. I mean, uh, again, uh, this is uh, not uh, uh, a, a space of time devoted to data uh, to data manipulation. But of course, if you are interested, then uh, try to take a look to this data, uh, the data arrangement in which the data are stored in such a way to recognize that different complaints, of course, can come from different buildings. And then let's go to fit this higher NB regression dot stun. The higher NB regression dot stun is a Poisson, is a is, sorry, is a negative, a hierarchical negative binomial distribution. So basically the data is exactly as before, but this time uh, there is also the exposure. I have some building level data. So in this case, uh, uh, for instance, the number of buildings. Uh, I have uh, a matrix of data, which is called uh, and referred as building data. And then here I have the infi, which is defined as the inverse of the over dispersion parameter for the for the negative binomial distribution. Uh, usually in uh, STAN, uh, the negative binomial distribution is uh, uh, used uh, um, uh, with the inverse of the over dispersion parameter. Uh, in terms of uh, this is a, this appears to be a simpler and more effective parameterization in terms of computation. Then there is the beta or coefficient on, on the traps. And then I have the building specific intercepts here. Uh, these are called uh, mu. Uh, so sorry, because uh, um, in this case, uh, um, in, uh, in, the, in the slides, uh, I, I, I use the term alpha. But anyway, this is not so important. These are the building specific intercepts uh, varying across uh, the different buildings. In the transform parameters, so you can see uh, what the transform parameter usually is, uh, I can define the transform parameter phi as the inv of inv phi. This is important because usually when you get the, the estimates, uh, the posterior estimates for, for your over dispersion parameter, you are not interested in uh, uh, the inverse of phi, but directly on phi. So basically you can here uh, realize the transformation simply by writing this expression here. So basically here I can define my uh, my model uh, directly taking into consideration that there is of course the hierarchy in my data. So in this case uh, uh, the building uh, I'm considering here the uh, intercept of uh, uh, of my model that are uh, varying uh, across uh, across buildings of course, uh, I have also uh, a matrix of uh, data uh, accounting for uh, the building level, so building level predictors. So now the number of complaints, let's go to the likelihood parts. The number of complaints 
is defined as negative binomial chu log. Negative binomial chu in STAN is referred for uh, the a, a second parameterization of the negative binomial, which is, uh, as I told you, more effective than the first parameterization. So that's the reason why usually uh, when you have to use a negative binomial, please use the negative binomial chu. Mu is defined uh, as building at x. So building at a, a, e, a, the x is a vector of indexes uh, of dimension 120, which basically has uh, values one for the buildings, uh, for the complaints uh, arising in building one, uh, values two uh, for the complaints arising in, in uh, building two and so on. So basically this is the hierarchy included in my model, accounting for intercept, intercepts which are varying across the different buildings. Then the structure is basically the same as before. So the number of traps, uh, in this case, the offset uh, phi, the over dispersion parameter, and then in the generated quantities as, as before, I can generate hypothetical replication for my data. So line 55 uh, by using, uh, in this case, the negative binomial to log save RNG because RNG uh, maybe I didn't tell you this before, but RNG is like uh, uh, the R norm, R voice in, in R. So RNG is the suffix used to generate data in STAN. So basically when you use the RNG suffix, uh, it, this, this means that you are generating hypothetical replications, uh, hypothetical values from, uh, from your likelihood. So basically you are uh, sampling hypothetical values for your uh, negative binomial. Uh, again, discard for a moment the line 56 because uh, in a while I will be telling you uh, what does it mean. Let's go directly to fit the model. So let's go to fit the hierarchical model. So let's go to uh, the pass control 2. Sorry, uh, because I have many open file. Let's go directly to pass control 2. So you can compile this model and you can uh, fit this model. I have already done this. So let's go directly to, uh, in this case, to extract the summary. There is this function extract, which is very useful. Uh, this is a function from Stan, from R Stan. So you can uh, easily uh, work uh, with this function here. Let's go to print uh, the posterior summaries. So we can uh, take a look to the posterior summary. Remember, uh, as usual in Bayesian inference, that you should uh, uh, check the convergence of your algorithm and in some sense also the efficiency of your uh, Markov chain algorithm in uh, picking uh, uh, independent values from your Markov chain by looking at two values, basically the number of effective sample sizes and the Gelman-Rubin statistics uh, uh, that are at, uh, Gelman-Rubin statistics uh, are at uh, is a is a statistics accounting for, uh, uh, for um, I mean, for for uh, checking whether the uh, chains have been mixed or not. So usually the threshold is uh, 1.1. When R at is under the threshold, is uh, lower than the threshold 1.1. Uh, this basically means that the chains have been uh, mixed and that we got the convergence for that parameter. The number of effective sample size is. Uh, Less, uh, less easy to, to be interpreted because, of course, there is not a threshold for the effective sample sizes. But when the effective sample size is very small and small uh, compared to the number of iterations of your Marco Chain Monte Carlo, this basically means that your algorithm is not able to pick independent value from your Marco Chain. So this could be a problem. So. Uh, basically, here uh, I'm using uh, 4,000 iterations. Uh, I guess uh, so I don't remember the number of iterations, but should be uh, 4,000. Uh, in this case, the effective sample sizes for a sigma mu, which is the variance of the intercept. This is the parameter accounting for the variation across buildings. is very very small. So basically, this is a possible signal that something uh, maybe went not so well in the in the model. Uh, let's go to see the MCMC MC trace of the model. If we put the MCMC MC trace, I mean, there is something went wrong here, because as you can see here, I have red bars according to divergent transitions. So Stan is warning me that something went 
let's say, wrong in the model, because in this case, uh, divergent transitions are portions of the parameter space where the Markov chains got stuck, or portion of the parameter space where the Markov chains are not able to explore in a satisfactory way the parameter space. So there, in that, in that, let's say in that step, in that iteration, so let's say iteration 600, 601, and so on, my Markov chains got stuck. And this is a, a let's say, a, a possible signal that something went wrong in my model. This is not something um, directly related to the model checking. Because if you remember, model checking means uh, I want to check whether my model is able to replicate uh, the data in a satisfactory way. This is something more related to the uh, technical working of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. This is something that is not optimal. This is not efficient in terms of computing, but we should anyway take into consideration this because of course these uh, problems can have uh, uh, very serious consequences on the inferential conclusions. Uh, there is um, there are other ways to look for this kind of possible divergences and this kind of possible problems in the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, so we can uh, use, uh, for instance, the scatter with the divergences. <clears throat> this is a plot basically that uh, is a bivariate plot in which we have the logarithm of sigma mu and mu four. So the fourth intercept, the, the, the intercept, uh, the random intercept for the fourth building and the red points uh, basically are suggesting where my Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is somehow stacking. Remember, in uh, in other software such as Winbugstan, we never have something like this. We never have a sort of suggestion where my algorithm is going to fail, where my algorithm is not efficient, is not uh, enough efficient to explore the parameter space. This is something completely revolutionary uh, for uh, some for the for the story for the history of Hamilton for of Marco Chain Monte Carlo methods, because in this case we have a warning that the algorithm is not somehow exploring in that iteration, in those iterations, the parameter space in a very efficient way. And if the algorithm is not able to explore efficiently the parameter space, this means basically that I could have also problem in the final estimates, in the final procedure estimates. So <clears throat> there is a, another possibility, a graphical possibility, which is the parallel parallel plot. Uh, which MCMC parkour. This is a parallel plot you will be visualizing in a while. This is a very, let's say, a heavy plot, but uh, let's say somehow effective. It is um, also taking a, a little bit to 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 be fitted. Uh, let's uh, let's wait for a while. Otherwise, <clears throat> I can show you uh, directly from the slides. Now should be should be ready because it is very very heavy from a computational point of view. Let's see. Otherwise, I can you I can I can scroll directly on the slides. Yes, this is something that I will be I will be doing. So let's go to now to again show you the slides. OK. Let's go on slide. 70. Sorry, slide 80, I guess, because also the slide in PDF is taking so long. So now you should be able to see. This is the parallel plot. In the X axis, you have basically all the parameters of your model. And each blue uh, line basically is a, a trajectory of the Marco chain for, uh, for the, the Marco chain algorithm for all the parameters. Basically, the red lines are uh, collecting all the trajectories when the parameters has, have some particular problems. As you can see, problems arise basically when sigma alpha is very small. So when sigma alpha is very small, by interpretation, what does it mean? Sigma alpha is very small. Let's go to see again the model. So sigma alpha is the standard deviation of the prior distribution for the intercepts. When this is when this is very small, 
basically means that there is not so much variation in the different intercept for the different buildings. So this means basically that uh, I have to change something in my model. I have to make something different because when sigma alpha is very small, this is basically affecting the estimation for the single alphas. As you can see again from uh, slide 80, so when sigma alpha is very small, basically, uh, I have many problems with all the alphas. And this is not something, let's say, uh, safe, because this means that in these trajectories of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, the final conclusions, the final inferential conclusions are not so safe. There is something which, in some sense, stuck previously in the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. This is not an easy uh, topic, because uh, in order to be very expert for divergent transitions in STAN, uh, you should at least read some uh, guidelines and some uh, practical guides, for instance, in internet or whatever you, for instance, in the STAN manual, because it is not very, it is not very easy also to uh, to understand uh, why in this case something uh, went wrong. But just to give you some possible, some possible, uh, some possible uh, uh, helps. Uh, for instance, whenever you will be uh, working with a practical project, you will be, uh, for instance, fitting a hierarchical model or a very complex model in STAN. When you read something like this, so there were, in this case, uh, uh, 915 divergent transitions. This basically means that uh, for 915 iterations of the chain, basically the Hamilton and Monte Carlo was not able to be, let's say, if, uh, effective. So stuck in the parameter space due to the, let's say, to the shape of the posterior distribution. So. This is an indication that there may be some regions of the posterior that have been not explored by the Markov chains. In this example, a good choice whenever you get divergent transitions is to reparameterize your model. So reparameterizing your model means taking the model unchanged. So we are not going to change the model. We are taking the model unchanged, but we transform some of the parameters in such a way that for the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, it is easier to explore uh, the, the, those regions of the parameter space. So <clears throat> in some sense, uh, before we go through exactly uh, this uh, reparameterization, uh, in some sense, uh, I want to give you what we are going to see. Uh, from how, how can you get uh, the idea that something went wrong in your Hamilton and that uh, something uh, produced divergent transitions. So we have to examine the fitted parameters values, including the effective sample size. When the effective sample size is very small, there is a signal that, uh, that the algorithm is not able to pick out uh, many values for that parameters. And also the trace plots and the scatter plots that I show you uh, so far uh, reveal particular patterns in location of the divergences, and these are uh, basically uh, um, these are represented by the red bars. So, uh, how sh what could we do? A good uh, suggestion, in some sense, uh, is uh, to change the parameterization of my model, because in my stand model, I write what is usually referred in the stand community as the center parameterization. I wrote my linear predictor as uh, alpha bi plus beta xi and then alpha b normal distribution mu plus and some let's say uh, building level covariance we should in some sense uh, break up the uh, couple the correlation existing between the sigma alpha and the alpha b because we have already seen from the parallel plot that whenever sigma alpha is small we could have some problems in the estimation of the single alphas. This is basically done via very simple tricks, which is called non-center parameterization. What we should do? So we write again the linear predictor as before, but now we write each alpha as mu plus theta, theta b, where z b are again the data, uh, the covariates uh, uh, for different buildings plus sigma alpha times alpha tilde b. Alpha tilde b is given a prior normal 0, 1. So basically what we are doing, 
we are defining a vector of auxiliary variables in the parameters block, it's called alpha rho, that is given a normal 0, 1 distribution in the model block. But basically, this is exactly the same as before, but we are giving and we are taking one level, one further level to break in, in some sense, the correlation existing between sigma alpha and each alpha. So this non-central parameterization is much and much effective in STAN because by sampling some auxiliary variables, it is often allowing you to get some reasonable estimates by maintaining the same model as before, because basically this is the same as before, because whenever we have here some normal zero one uh, as a linear combination of, uh, of uh, deterministic quantities, this is again a normal distribution mu plus blah, blah, blah. But in some sense, we are making a trick. So we are using some auxiliary variables defined in terms of the parameters block. And we are writing these uh, as sample from a normal zero one. So how can we translate this? In the transform parameter, we have to rewrite our alphas, our intercept in this way, where we write explicitly sigma alpha times alpha rho, where alpha rho are some auxiliary variables defined directly in the model block sorry, defined a little in the parameters block and given a normal prior 0, 1 in the uh, model block. This gives, uh, in some sense, uh, to the alpha, this kind of distribution, the same as before. So basically, we are attaining the same model as before, but we are decoupling the dependence of the density of each element of alpha from sigma alpha. So, you can try to fit this new model version in STAN. This is not difficult because uh, the name of the model is exactly the same as before in the STAN program, but it's called non-center parameterization. So it, it, there is the suffix NCP. You can go through how this is written in STAN, and this is basically nothing but using uh, a sort of trick in which you define an auxiliary variable vector in the parameter block and then you define your intercept in the transform parameter block. And then you assign a normal zero one in the model block. So when working with hierarchical models, but also with complex model, it is convenient in some sense to break up the dependence of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the parameter governing the variation of your parameters uh, across the groups uh, and those parameters. If we fit this new model version is done, we can examine then the effective sample size uh, and we realize uh, that the effective sample size now is uh, big enough, is not anymore uh, 197, but it is uh, 10 times bigger. So this means basically that the algorithm is able, is more able to pick out uh, plausible values for sigma alpha, plausible independent values. But uh, then we can compare, for instance, uh, what happens in terms of divergent transition. So we can take, for instance, uh, in this case, uh, the scenario for uh, the scatter plot between the log of sigma alpha and alpha four in the center parameterization and in the non-center parameterization, we do not have in, any more divergent transitions. We can take again uh, the uh, scat the the parallel plot. Do you remember this was the parallel plot uh, in the center parameterization in the non-center parameterization? Basically, we do not have more. We do not have any more problems when sigma alpha is small. So basically, in some sense, uh, the parameterizations has improved the effective, sign, uh, the effective sample size of alpha. We do not have any more divergent transitions. And in some sense, uh, we got uh, an estimated model, a fitting model, which has no any more uh, big problems in terms of the uh, of the of how the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, work to produce the final estimates. Also, for this final model, we can take uh, the model checking, uh, for instance, the PPC dense overlay, and we can see that this is satisfactory. Uh, this was happening also, to be honest, for the just for the simple negative binomial, 
but in this case, uh, this is happening again for the negative binomial. We can take uh, for the different buildings, uh, for instance, the mean of the observed data uh, of the complaints uh, uh, plotted against uh, the replicated uh, complaints uh, uh, according to the posterior predictive distribution of the replications. So basically, we can compare the observed values with the replications. And as you can see, the observed values uh, are consistent with the replicated values. So basically, this is suggesting that the model should be able, even at the group level, to, let's say, uh, to uh, produce hypothetical replication plausible and close to the observed data. Uh, we can again check the proportion of zero and basically we obtain something also uh, satisfactory in this case. And also the standardized residuals are improving because now only four of uh, the standardized residuals are slightly exceeding uh, the boundary uh, two. So basically, uh, as you know, if the model is fitting well, uh, I should expect that uh, uh, the majority of the standardized residuals uh, should lie between the bands uh, minus two and two. So basically, if you uh, get a comparison with the negative binomial model, for instance, let's go back to slide, uh, uh, for instance, 71, and try to compare this graph of standardized residuals for the negative binomial with this graph of standardized residuals for the hierarchical negative binomial. So what does it mean? By accounting for hierarchies, we basically got an important aim. We basically understood uh, that uh, to, uh, let's say, acknowledge, uh, to fit a better model, we should always acknowledge for the nature of the data. And the nature of the data is hierarchical, multi-level in this case because we have data clustered and grouped in different buildings. So this is an important take on message, I guess, because uh, this is uh, uh, suggesting us that with STAN, we could uh, immediately, let's say, um, start from a simple model to make this model more difficult, more difficult, more difficult, and again, and uh, by checking for, for instance, model checking and divergent transitions issue, we can also reparameterize our model, and we can, in some sense, arrive at the, let's say, in this case, at the final model, which is, in some sense, satisfactory. So what I brought today in the, in the class is a sort of uh, model's history, because we started from the simplest model ever, a Poisson distribution, and then, by criticizing our model, we understood how to increase, uh, according to a top-up strategy, our uh, models. Uh, and we arrived at the final model, which is not very simple, let's say, because it is a hierarchical negative binomial model with uh, all the predictors, with the offset term, with some, uh, let's say, weekly informative prior. So I guess that in this uh, hour and a half uh, during this example, uh, we reviewed many stuff. Maybe now you are not, uh, let's say, uh, aware of how many stuff we talked about in this one hour and 20. But basically, we reviewed many, many stuff uh, from weekly informative priors, for, uh, from covariates, from offset, from uh, choice of the sampling distribution, from model checking, and so on. Now, we are almost done. I mean, the, the, the story is not over, of course. I recommend you, I suggest you to further read, uh, for instance, chapter six from the Bayesian data analysis books from Gelman, Gelman et al. And also uh, to have a, a, a better and larger and deeper uh, overview of what is reparameterization in STAN models and how you can fix many problems in STAN by using of by use of reparameterization. And this is not something that happens, for instance, in WinBugs and JAX uh, often. So to have a better overview of reparameterization in STAN, uh, you can look at chapter 20 from the STAN user's guide. And this is uh, strongly suggested because I guess that in if you use STAN um, in your future projects or in your current project, it is uh, possible, it is likely that you will be encountering some problems, some divergent transitions, some technical problems, and many times using a wise reparameterization could help. For instance, uh, when using a hierarchical model, using the non-centered parameterization is much more effective than using the so-called centered parameterization because it is 
decoupling the dependence between uh, parameters and hyperparameters, and it is getting better and better uh, final uh, inferential conclusions. Now, uh, we are almost done. I don't want to bother you again. Only 10 minutes again, only 10 minutes yet, because one final question could be, OK, uh, I understood we went from the simplest model to, let's say, a hierarchical model and so on, and we understood that um, uh, this model is better. OK, but how can we quantify whether this model is really better? Because basically what we did is a model checking separately for each model. So of course the model checking that we did for the final model resulted, resulted to be better than the model checking for the first model, for instance, for the Poisson. Because you remember, uh, with the PPC dense overlay, uh, we realized that the negative binomial hierarchical model is much better. Uh, with the standardized residuals, we realized that this, this is better. And of course, with the statistics, uh, we realized that this is better. But how can we quantify? So basically, in STAN, there is a, a particular way of quantifying and to make model comparisons uh, by using uh, one predictive information criteria, which basically is an extension of the archaic information criteria. So you should already know the archaic information criteria, which is basically a, a way of comparing models which are not uh, forced to be nested. You can compare also non-nested models with a kike. The lower is the kike information criteria uh, and the better in some sense is that model. So the, the same interpretation is valid also for other information criteria such as the deviance information criteria, the Bayesian information criteria, the Watanabe archaic information criteria. I just want you, I just uh, uh, that you know that in STAN, you can perform two uh, particular predictive information criteria directly uh, with no, uh, I mean, very, very simple, being very in a very simple way, quite easily. The Watanabe information criteria and the Lee one out cross validation information criteria. So basically these values, I'm not going into the theory. You can find some theory in the slides, but of course this is not a, a scope of this uh, two hours uh, lab to give you more theoretical details. You can have uh, some more theoretical details by looking in the slides and in the further readings. I just uh, ask you to understand uh, this final step that we can compute a sort of, uh, let's say, pointwise log likelihood for our models, which is useful to capture and to compute a measure of uh, global predictive accuracy for my model. So. Uh, log uh, Lee one out cross validation and Watanabe Akaik information criteria work in a different way than Akaik information criteria and the deviance information criteria and so on, because basically uh, they are in some sense computing a predictive accuracy at the level of the single data point. And this is quite important because, uh, I mean, for each data point, you can make a, a sort of prediction and understand uh, how this prediction is with respect to the n minus one other data points. So this is basically the logic of the Lee one out cross validation. Uh, the only stuff you are required to do it to perform Lee one out cross validation is by using the loop package. The loop package, it is another package uh, related to the Stan ecosystem. So it is sufficient uh, uh, writing in the stun code in the generated quantities uh, to store a log likelihood, a pointwise log likelihood quantities. You remember uh, before when we were looking at the stun code, at the stun programs, and you can find everything in the stun programs in the in the GitHub folder that you already downloaded. I remember I told you discard for a while this log leak because uh, I will be telling something afterwards. OK, the log leak is an important, is a relevant quantity that is uh, uh, required uh, by the loop package to compute the Lee one out cross validation information criteria. Basically, this is nothing but a pointwise log likelihood. So, I mean, for the eight school example, do you remember the eight school example? This is nothing but to define for the J school the normal LPDF, this is basically the log predict log uh, log probability density function. This stands for log probability density function 
for the yj given theta j and sigma j, but we already have theta j and sigma j because these are basically taken from the posterior distribution. So the one line of code to define the log pointwise, the, the pointwise log likelihood. Basically, when you use uh, the loop package uh, and here you can find all the details, uh, it is uh, sufficient uh, once you store the pointwise log likelihood in the generated quantities uh, to use the extract log leak function with the name of the model fitted to use uh, the loop function of the loop package to this uh, log leak one, which is extracting for each different uh, replica replication of the data, the pointwise log likelihood, and then you can obtain a measure of the predictive information criteria for the model. As you can see here, uh, PLU is the number of effective parameters. And this is uh, something similar to what happens also with the deviance information criteria. With Also there, you have a measure of effective parameters. In this case, this is 1.3. What does it mean in the, F, in the, in the eight school example? 1.3 is slightly, slightly bigger than one, but one is the model which is not making any kind of assumption about the coaching effects. It's, it is just assuming that the coaching effect is unique. Whereas the model assuming that there are eight different coaching effects uh, is a model, uh, I mean, in the, in the other way around, which is accounting for eight different uh, coaching effects. So it's uh, eight parameters in this case. The, there are eight different coaching effects. 1.3 stands between, but it is closer to the model, which is just using one coaching effect. So this is basically suggesting that this model for the school uh, could be in some sense also well described by a model not using uh, the coaching effect distribution, the coaching effect prior for each school. Maybe also by using just a single parameter could have been enough. This is suggesting something like this, but I don't want to uh, bother you again. So this is basically this function is returning and yielding a Lee out cross validation criteria, say 61.7, whatever is uh, these values. Also, uh, with the measure of uncertainty, uh, this is the standard error. Now we can use this measure, for instance, to compare models. And we can compare, for instance, uh, the model of the school by enjoying three different priors. For instance, a uniform for tau, an inverse gamma, an alt Cauchy, and we can compare the Louis Lewick criteria for all these models. As you can see, the model two, uh, the model uh, enjoying uh, the, uh, in this case, uh, the inverse gamma, is slightly favorite in terms of the lower I see because uh, I mean the interpretation is the same as like information criteria. The lower is the value for the Lewick. Uh, and the better is the model. Here the difference is very, very small. But I mean, the model using uh, uh, a, an inverse gamma prior is slightly favorite in terms of the lower LUSE and also uh, Watanabe Kag information criteria because with the same uh, package, with the WIKE function, you can also compute the Watanabe Kag information criteria. As you can see, the LUIC and the WIKE here are almost uh, uh, perfectly identical. So uh, there is only one very, very, very small uh, difference. Uh, of course, uh, predictive information criteria are not perfect, but it is uh, uh, pr using predictive information criteria can be much useful when you want to compare models. And uh, of course, uh, using predictive information criteria sophisticated such as, for instance, the Lee one out cross validation criteria and uh, uh, the Watanabe Kag information criteria, which are directly performed by Stan, can be much more effective than using, for instance, the Akag information criteria. There are some papers in the literature stating that the Akag information criteria is not well suited uh, when dealing with hierarchical models. And also the deviance information criteria, which is uh, directly, uh, for instance, returned by JAGS, and WinBugs can have some problems because uh, somehow you can have problems 
uh, when you use the posterior mean of your uh, of your parameters. So let's say that the uh, uh, one autocross validation criteria and what an abacag information criteria are somehow more sophisticated. If you want to have uh, a more uh, a, a, a very, let's say a very intense or at least a good uh, treatment of these topics, you can have a further readings uh, from these two papers. I put these two papers directly into the uh, further material slides, but I want to conclude with uh, with what? I want to show you the model comparisons for the models of the cockroaches example, because you remember I told you, okay, we did the model check for all the models, but at the end we didn't realize which is the best models in terms of some predictive information criteria. So I go directly to an HTML already compiled. You can find this directly in the uh, directly in the slides uh, in the in the test control subfolder. Let me share the screen for the last time and then you are free guys. So. If you look uh, if you look here. As you can as you can see model comparison, we can compute all the LULIC for all the models and all the WIC for all the models. And I remind you the lowest, the lower is the LULIC and the better is the model uh, predictive accuracy. So the better in some sense is the model. What do you expect? Do you expect that, uh, uh, for instance, the higher hierarchical uh, negative binomial model is much better than the Poisson model? Let's see what happens. I show you directly the compiled code that you can find in the subfolder. I show you finally the final plots. So the look for the Poisson model with only the traps as covariate is uh, something like uh, 3,800. Uh, then we have the Poisson with the, the offset, which is even worse in this case. Then we have a very, very, very intense jump uh, for the model with the negative binomial. So just by using the negative binomial, we have a difference of something around uh, um, 1,500 in terms of look, which is an enormous jump in this case. And here, by using hierarchical model, this is the hierarchical model with the uh, center parameterization. This is the uh, hierarchical model with non-center parameterization, which is basically the same. I mean, these are perfectly equal models, but the first one, uh, let's say that is not uh, much effective in terms of the final estimates. And this is the final model that I didn't show you, but in the you can find this in the in the compiled document, pest control example. So you can find even more there, but because this is a, a further hierarchical models in which not only the intercepts, but also the slopes of the covariates parameters are allowed to vary by groups. So not only the slopes uh, accounting for the different buildings, but also this the the slopes for the parameters, I mean the slopes, uh, in meaning uh, uh, the beta, are allowed to vary uh, across different buildings, across different groups. And this model is even, in, even improving a bit the situation, because I mean uh, here the scale is very, very high, but there is an improvement of about uh, 100 points in terms of LUIC and also in terms of WIC, and this is usually uh, a big, a big jump. But the super big jump, here is uh, uh, going from the Poisson models to the negative binomial models. And this is something that we expected because you remember that the model checking was very bad for the Poisson models and was even uh, much better for the negative uh, for the negative binomial models. And then uh, going to hierarchies, uh, we improved much uh, the situations. So guys, uh, by concluding, uh, what we did, what we saw, we saw many stuff. Maybe, maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe now you are lost, you are tired, and this uh, makes perfectly sense. But we construct models in Stan from the simplest one to the to uh, let's say more difficult ones. We understood how to check models, how to make uh, model checking and posterior predictive checking in Stan from a graphical point of view, from a quantitative point of view. And we uh, also understood at, at the end how we could compare models. So basically, we also had a sort of model comparison tool, which is very effective because uh, if you are interested, go through the uh, theoretical material that you find 
online that you find in the folder, but basically uh, you can um, employ quite easily a uh, Leeward Autocross validation criteria and Watanabe Akag information criteria and uh, in some sense uh, compute quite efficiently uh, those uh, criteria to compare models, which are not forced to be nested one each other. And this is very important because, of course, you don't want just to uh, compare uh, nested models, but you want uh, a, a tool for uh, uh, broader uh, comparisons. OK, guys, uh, thank you again for uh, the attention, but I'm here for any kind of possible and eventual doubt or question. If you have. Give me also feedback. I mean, did you find all of this uh, quite, uh, let's say, I mean, I repeated something that you already know. I did something that was useful. Is Do you think it's useful for you? Uh, I mean, um, if you want, you can also, I mean, you can also write the feedback here in the chat and I uh, read afterwards. I'm, I'm very glad that if you give me some feedbacks because of course uh, you are PhD students. And I know that when you are PhD students, I mean, you have different and different uh, requirements. Of course, some of you may be working in a Bayesian approach, some other not. Uh, some other are very expert about, already expert about stun and the hierarchical models, some others are not. So basically, I, I have to average, of course. So uh, if you want to tell me a, a feedback or uh, ask me something now, otherwise you can write some feedbacks here. Uh, you can uh, tell feedbacks to Elias and Elias uh, tells me. Only good feedbacks, please. <laughs> so I mean, um, hopefully the the lab was um, was useful. Hopefully. So um, if there are no questions for Dr. Leonardo Ajibi, uh we would like to thank uh, Leonardo for this very very informative lab, and uh, all who attended this uh, this lab. Also, I hope you got something. Uh, something from it. You can always contact uh, Dr. Edding uh, in, I mean, via email, I guess, Leonardo. Yes, yes, I, 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 read, I write my email here for any doubt. I, re, I write in the chat, so this is my email, legd.units.et, okay. le so you can write me for, uh, I mean, any curiosity doubt for having more material, because I mean, I put in the GitHub repo some material. Oh, uh, that's great. But if you that's want great. more, if you want more, I can give you more. And uh, I mean, uh, I'm more than welcome to speak with you because uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I have to say something uh, because you, you did not mention it. But uh, uh, I mean, Dr. Eddie has worked with uh, Andrew Geldman himself. So okay. <laughs> uh, he's quite experienced. Uh, and he, we, we are privileged to have him here. So once again, thank you, Leonardo. Thank you, and, guys. Thank uh, you, Ineas. Now, hopefully, we can arrange something similar to this in the future under completely different circumstances. Let's uh, let's, hope, <laughs> let's hope for the best. Uh, I want you to right. finalize and and thank you for for your words. A uh, part of the material I, I introduced today is based on previous courses we had with uh, Jonah Gabri, which is one of the uh, stand developers, one of the main stand developers. So I'm really grateful to him also for uh, some of the material because, of course, uh, he is, uh, is uh, very, very good uh, also in, in teaching. And uh, I mean, I'm more than glad to have with you possible meetings or I mean, just uh, very, very quick feelings. So uh, thanks, Elias, a lot. Thanks, Yanis. It's not here, but thanks, Yanis. Right. Uh, thanks a few for your attention. And uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe we will be meeting uh, in physical presence soon, hopefully. Hopefully, Let's see. yes. Hopefully, yes. All hopefully. right. So that concludes today's lab. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for being here. And what can I say? So, uh, go check Stan because it is it is a very 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 useful basin tool. So, bye everybody. Bye guys, thank you. Talk soon. Bye, thank bye, you. Bye, bye, thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.